Hey guys, this will be video five for the uh, how to design build a custom Sparkle Flying V. And uh, per 1950 specs, uh, even though this is really my own design. Uh, I just finished a video, video number four, in case you haven't watched my series for a while. And I was going to pause the camera and I mistakenly uh, just ended the video. So, uh, and then I got to thinking about it. It was probably for the best because it allowed me to kind of back up and uh, collect myself and not, and not make too many promises because uh, building a neck, uh, I think in one of my last series, I think I spent something like seven or eight different videos, if not 10 different videos that were almost an hour long about building those necks. Uh, there's so much to building a neck that I would almost uh, encourage you uh, maybe build a Telecaster, as I've always joked. And I, actually, that's not a joke. That's a great guitar. But when you get, when you go into the world of mortise and tin, and I'm I'm not digressing here, but when you go off into the world of designing and building a mortise and tin and neck, and uh, you know getting it right, especially if you've never done it before, uh, that that's going to be a really difficult job, and it's probably not going to be a job that's enjoyable. So I'm going to pick back up where I left off, where I was going to talk about building necks, but let me back up and discuss binding just a little bit more. That way I can get the body off the table, maybe even pause the video, collect myself and think about exactly what it is that I want to talk about, about uh, when you're building either just one neck or building two necks. So when I was talking about, you've got to really, really take the time to engineer out your binding what I meant was the binding depth in relationship to the binding singular and or bindings plural that you were planning on doing because you know you can end up uh, doing an enormous amount of binding work uh, to create a beautiful guitar but you might get in over your head very quickly and when I say engineer everything so that it finishes out properly I got to clarify this. It may be a little bit redundant here, but after after it's all settled and done and the, uh, the binding glue has dried a good 24 hours, if I forget to uh, talk about it, just take a mental picture. Stuart McDonald bind all. I love that stuff. It's a little expensive, but man, it's worth it's worth the money. But after it's all said and done. Let me back up. When you're, if if I were just going to bind this guitar body with one single piece of binding, as I mentioned, a sixteenth inch route de depth this way thickness, uh, thickness for a sixty thousandths binding is just perfect. If the body's already finished, meaning it's already painted, but if you if you had this raw body, and this will explain my reasoning for doing the paintwork first. But if you had this raw body and, and it was antique pine, a hundred something years old, and it had a lot of roughness to it, and you were pretty excited about the initial rough out, and you went ahead and grabbed your router and routed this channel, and then it even did the binding there, and you're thinking, oh man, yeah, that's beautiful. And then you start sanding a little bit to try to flush it up. Well, what's going to happen is... Um, you're, you're going to start losing the thickness of the binding as you try to clean this up. And that's only 10% only of the problems. The real problems are going to present themselves when um, you start trying to shoot uh, over 7 to 10 coats of color. And it's not black, it's not this, it's not that. It's any color that you do is going to have a mill thickness and it's going to start building up. And you're going to get yourself in trouble because you you will have had to have taped your binding off. And then once you finally get your color correct and your sides level and you've sanded through and you've effed up the tape that you had and then you've retaped it and you've shot it again and you've fought it and you've just, it's nearly driven you crazy. After you've pulled that tape off, after you finally get that body where you want it, you realize this binding is honestly a good 30 thousandths below the top of the the color 
And now you're in a world of hurt because you're trying to figure out how to catch up. Now you're having to tape off this and just shoot endless overcoats of clear in order to try to catch up. And then you end up playing this, um, you know, it's like, oh, I, don't, I don't even know what the comparison would be. It's just, uh, you just end up in this nightmarish situation of trying to get the two surfaces to level out. And that's what I meant by, I think I'm just going to go ahead and paint this thing up to, I said 100%, but about 70 to 80%, and then really get a beautiful surface. Then once I get the surface I want, then I'm going to use my router bit, not this bit, but then I'm going to use my router a bit to come across here and let the, the bearing just make one sweet, soft, gentle pass. I don't press into the body because I don't want to risk burning anything there, but just one clean pass. Uh, let's see, would it be that way? Uh, it doesn't matter. A, a cutting cut. Don't do a climbing cut. You'll get yourself in trouble unless you know what you're doing. But then you cut the channel based on that finished surface, one sixteenth of an inch deep. Then glue in your uh, 60 thousandths binding, and my fingernail is just barely catching that. Now guess what I'm ready to do? Whoa, um, well, I'm repair a body that I almost put a horrific ding in. Uh, now I'm ready to clean it up just a little bit and start shooting two to three coats of clear nitrocellulose lacquer, and it's a beautiful finish. Now everything levels out really well. And I hope that wasn't boring to any of you guys, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, when I was studying the Robert Benedetto video series, uh, Robert Benedetto came right out of the gate. He was binding, I, I think he was doing something like seven pieces of binding at once. All the real thin binding, and then even the outer, the big thick outer binding, he, he put every bit of that on in one shot. And uh, it was really impressive on film. But with respect, it didn't do any, it did, it was, it, there wasn't anything about it that was beneficial for the beginner guitar builder because man, he made it look really, really easy. And I lost a lot of money screwing up binding, thinking that, oh yeah, the way he did it, I'll just do this and I'll work from this direction. Uh, it's very complex. And that's what I meant by to build a flying V Imagine keeping multiple pieces of binding perfectly true and pressed clean so that the, the third layer of black in there doesn't get a little bit open right there and swell up more than, than the, the second layer of black. And you'll, you'll have these little divots in there. And that's what I meant by one of the last videos. Uh, it's actually easier to bind a, a big a, a big hollow body guitar let's say you're going to start in the center and then and then you, you you got your you got it started and and then then you could do the robert benedetto roger ramjet you know but see this is already i need to show this i, I know this sounds And I'm sorry I wasn't a little bit more organized, but uh, I really want to put this behind me because I don't want I don't ever want anybody to think that, oh, wow, that's pretty easy. I can do binding. Uh, but basically what you would do, you would kind of glue that in, in place first and you, would, and you would have all of these loose strips of binding and then you shoot your glue in there. And I'm not going to go into that, but it's not that difficult then to come in and do the Robert Benedetto process where... Then you pull it all around. Keep in mind that piece of binding is like 34 inches long. And then you're able to really push it in and hold it. And you're kind of pulling it here. And then you start taping it. Well, well yeah, that's, that's not that difficult to do because you're able to use the curvature of the body to help you hold it in place. But you don't have that on the flying V until you get up to a corner. And that's what I meant by... Uh, the flying V will humble you very quickly, especially when you do more than like one one piece of binding. One piece is not that big of a deal because, you know, you could do a little bit of glue, hold it in place with your fingers, and you can do about eight inches at a time, tape it, then glue, then move up here, do that. 
And then, uh, and I would say I'm going to stop talking, but I, I, I just really need to drive that home that keep in mind, if I, if, if I, if I cover anything that's critical, critical, the more binding you do, the more it's going to swell. And you got to, you got to offset your routing channel according to how much your binding is going to swell and or how good you are at keeping your binding under control. Okay, so I'll stop right there and then we'll start talking about net construction. But uh, I don't want to say binding is hard because it's not hard. And man, does it ever really show your ability to build a beautiful guitar. So uh, the binding ends up being about uh, 7 to $10 a strip, regardless of whether it's 20 thousandths thick or a little bit thicker it's a little bit more the thicker it gets but from a a comparative standpoint you do a, a five piece bound top well then plan on spending about 60 to 70 dollars just for your binding plus your glue which is about 30 plus your tape which is what you know two or three bucks it's ten dollars here five dollars there thirty dollars here sixty dollars there you're you're looking at about a hundred dollars to do your binding uh, and then just on one side, and then if you wanted to do the back as well, we'll then add the expense of the actual additional binding. So it'd be about like what, another another sixty dollars. So a hundred fifty bucks to a hundred sixty bucks. Uh, that's that's sometimes that's more than the wood. So I hope that's not boring, and, and I just hope it's good information for you. And I'll I'll end on this note. Uh, if you get really good at doing binding, uh, that will really define your ability to be considered like a, a true luthier. And uh, I don't, I don't, I think, I don't think, obviously it doesn't affect the tone, but it's cert, people certainly buy with their eyes. Okay. If you get good at binding, uh, then you can start taking on projects like uh, Les Paul Custom Replicas and or big body uh, jazz guitar replicas where you're doing the five, seven piece, you know, binding. <clears throat> and it's really, really impressive. So, but uh, you'll, you'll lose, I don't need, mean to be negative, but you'll, you'll lose a lot of money very quickly or you'll lose your whole guitar because you, you might've realized that, oh man, all I really needed to do was just two pieces of binding, a black accent, you know, between the, the top and then just an outer binding, the white, and it would have been a beautiful little guitar. And truth be known, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, I, I, this will be the first Flying V that I've done where the binding was more than just one piece. Uh, the one piece 60 thousandths at a, at a quarter inch route is, is beautiful. I mean, it's really impressive. So uh, if you've never done binding before, uh, let's start out on our first few guitars just doing one-piece binding and uh, get good at it and then graduate up to uh, doing a little bit of accent. Okay. So let me check the time. But I know for a fact I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pause and then we're going to transition into uh, talking about neck construction. Okay, let me pick back up briefly, and I mean briefly just discuss this hollow body. I'm just going to do a, a bit of a flyby, and then we're going to get both of these bodies off the table and talk about next. Uh, I'm not going to do a video on this hollow body uh, flying V that I'm building for a, a while, maybe uh, not until I get the neck construction uh, going. So I just wanted to show you kind of what the, the process was. I epoxy glued the top down and let it dry overnight. And it was all about getting the perfect amount of epoxy on the, 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 the lower as well as the plate and make, so that you don't end up with any uh, crazy excess in there. I, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. That's a fairly good one. You don't really want, you don't really want to see any epoxy in there, uh, you know, boiling over or like rolling over. So, uh, so that stayed in the clamp uh, a good overnight, well, overnight, about 12 to 14 hours. And then as I started transitioning into doing other stuff, I just left it in the clamps. And, uh, but from the standpoint of, uh, you know, 
Yeah, very vocal. It's a very vocal guitar. Hear that it's very dark. See, it has a lot of depth as well. So anyway, uh, this is going to get tabled for a day or two while I work on this other stuff. Excuse me. And that's what I meant by uh, getting these two guitars caught up to the point to where um, I could start building the two of them in tandem. And that's, that's kind of what you want to see right there when you start building guitars. You want to see consistency, even though that hollow body is two inches uh, thick, and this is one and 11 sixteenths of an inch. You want to see consistency in your uh, designs. And when you start seeing that, you know that a, you've got good templates and your designs are, are perfectly, you know, they're working out really well. And you're beginning to do things like you, you get comfortable putting the strap buttons in the same location and your jack location in the same the, the output jack in the same location. That way you kind of start thinking about, yeah, I know what to expect when I get ready to drill that hole with a Forstner bit. I basically know exactly where to hold my drill because that's done with a handheld uh, half inch Milwaukee drill just because it's heavy duty. And I know exactly where to hold the drill. So it's nice to see consistency start to show up in your guitars. And also uh, if you're building cases, uh, then your cases uh, will uh, be able to, to hold either guitar as long as you anticipate the thicknesses. And maybe I won't knock that off the table. So let's talk about building next. Uh, you, as always, you start on paper, but uh, you don't you don't have to spend too much time on paper. Uh, uh, let, me, let me go straight to point. Typically, when you're building necks, this is how you're building necks. You're either building your necks out of like a large uh, piece of mahogany. That's quarter sewn. Quarter sewn this way. Can't remember the math. I think that's three inches that way, four inches that way. It allowed me to, to do a drop off and still get the necks. Okay like that right there. Therefore, my necks will be quarter sewn. That's very expensive. It's Honduran mahogany, but it's very predictable. And even though you start massing out down to this really small uh, thicknesses and stuff, you, you'd be surprised how they almost do not move. Uh, may, that's not the case with maple. There's no way I would take a piece of maple that big and, and cut it out and expect to get a neck that are three necks that one of them didn't get really weird or twist or something. So, so, but this is a fairly advanced uh, method of building necks using that board. Uh, what you probably, well, what I would strongly recommend if you've never built necks before and, and you're, but you're really going to do a, an arch top neck then uh, this is the, the route I recommend taking. You got, I would go with like a three quarter inch thick board, finished, perfectly uh, S4S, surfaced, 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 and surfaced. In other words, it's perfectly squared, it's perfectly true. And then you take your board, these boards are typically, you're gonna want these to be about, you know, roughly four inches by about 30 inches long. And then you're gonna be able to come in here with paper templates that you drew. I'm gonna blow through this because uh, if you were serious about this, just drop me a message and I'll, I'll direct you to which video series uh, it, it is that I, that I spent uh, just hour after hour explaining to you how to build a neck. So that's kind of how I, I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking when I'm building a neck or laying out, laying out in preparation for the rough out. Okay. And it's a very efficient use of the board. Uh, if you were, according to how thick your body is, will determine just how close you can get, you know, things like this right here. Because keep in mind the way I build my necks, I actually get another neck out of the middle as well. And I'll have the, uh, the headstock going on the middle neck going in between the two. 
and uh, I'm not going to get into that, but then all you can see right there, sometimes I'll clip the corner off the back of the tenon, and that will assure that I get that my neck doesn't end up getting uh, crazy in the middle. Everything stays very nice and true. But you can truly take advantage of this pre machined outside here and this pre machined outside here. And if this board was, you know, an, an inch and an eighth finished thickness, well, then uh, that board can be fairly narrow because you rough those two out and you glue those together and you have exactly what I'm holding in my hand here, a two and a quarter inch wide uh, neck with a, a center line glue up, which nothing wrong with that at all. I love doing two piece necks, They're very predictable. But uh, nonetheless, just, just kind of uh, grab a piece of uh, construction paper, design your neck, and think about minimum thicknesses. Do you want to do a taper? You know, how long is your headstock face? What is the pitch? And typically, I've been building 17 degree pitch headstocks, but that's pretty extreme. And my a penguin that I built, penguin replica that I built, I think it's like 14 or 15. And the acoustics on that guitar are, are phenomenal. And uh, so I say that to say this, I wouldn't dare go over 16 or 17 degree pitch. And uh, truth be known, the uh, Stuart McDonald uh, templates that I, set that I bought, I've talked about before, uh, even they sent their templates with a 16. 16 degree pitch headstock, it's not even 17. Okay, but just, you know, draw it out on paper and then start thinking through things like, you know, pitch locations and uh, join location, the scale. You know, this is a 24.562 inch scale, which is different than a 24 and three quarter, which is different than a 25, which is different from a 25 and a half. And then all of that is, ba what that means is the distance from the nut down to where it joins the body is going to be determinant upon that distance is going to be determinant upon which scale you elect to go with as well as what type of nut you elect to go with. If you go with a really wide Floyd Rose nut and you do not want that Floyd Rose nut to cantilever off, cantilever over the, the, the headstock pitch, well, then you're going to have to build your neck about uh, close to an eighth of an inch longer <clears throat> from this joint body joint out to the where it starts the area line where it starts pitching. OK, so and if anything, this is insanely complicated, but it's really enjoyable to sit down with like a fretboard scale calculator like Tundraman.com and just start uh, crunching the numbers and then just keep in mind. Uh, you're you're working with constants and variables, and and you might look at that and think, what is what does that mean? Well, the, the fretboard's flat, correct, or, or the lower surface is flat. Well, that's a constant. Is this this is flat, correct? Yeah. And then uh, so that's a constant. But how it could be vary is just the pitch. Well, we've already addressed that. We've determined that we want to go about sixteen to seventeen degree pitch. So that's a constant. Now we, we've determined, okay, we want this to be a minimum of uh, finished. Just bear with me. I'm not going to go into details about the, the options, but let's just talk about finished thicknesses. We want it to be uh, uh, no more than 9 sixteenths of an inch thick out at this end here, and we want it to be under 5 eighths of an inch thick here. If you're over 5 eighths of an inch thick out here, and to get a real cool jazz taper, you're going to run into problems with tuners like the Spurzel. They're not long enough to go through that thickness of a body. Your Cluson tuners, uh, your, your Cluson tuners, like on my 58 replica here, uh, they're pretty darn long. And you can see that, uh, see that tape, I'm going to try to be real still, see that taper right there? Out to that end, it's thinner out here than it is there. But these are really tall. Uh, these are really tall tuners, and you can see some cowboy. You know what, right there? I broke that string and just soldered it to uh, an eyelet. Works, stays in tune. But every now and then, um, you know. Well, never mind. 
So anyway, that's how you build a headstock. And, and you, you've got to determine what type of uh, tuner it is you're going with uh, if you're going to start doing tapering. But for the most part, your traditional headstock, uh, this just stays about 9 sixteenths an inch thick. The next variable would be, well, how thick do I want the fret, the neck at the first fret? You just got, that's your own personal preference. And then, you, so it'll be at the first fret and the 11th fret is going to determine the pitch. And I'm getting to the point now to where I don't pitch, I don't get much thicker out here as I used to. I used to be approximately three sixteenths, uh, excuse me, three thirty seconds. I did not misspeak. I'm typically, I used to be three thirty seconds of an inch thicker right here than I was right here. But right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowing that to get over. Uh, uh, let me think. Uh, let me make sure I don't misspeak. Yeah, about a sixteenth of an inch. I almost said an eighth. Uh, so, in other words, I'm keeping my uh, necks fairly flat, and and that's more along the lines of like a traditional fifties uh, um, Les Paul, and it's a very fast neck too. Very comfortable. Okay, so that's a variable. That's you know, and but you just check off these variables, turning them into constants make a template like this and just ask yourself, do you like what it looks like? You know, is the 17 degree pitch uh, what you want? And then you just start kind of feeling of it. Then you transfer that to uh, your three quarter board. Okay. And I mean an actual finished three quarter inch thick board. And then you, you, you uh, cut those three pieces out, glue them together with a tight bond glue, making certain that you keep it nice and flat right there and that you're very, very religiously making certain that that one doesn't slide a little bit because if it slides just the slightest, you'll lose your neck or you'll work yourself crazy trying to get it cleaned up. Okay, and I'm uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just reel myself back because there's a part of me I just I want to go into so much detail about how how I'm thinking when I'm doing these things, but I think a picture is worth a thousand words. And just just know that if you can if you can sit down on paper and start going through all these different calculations, and you can start seeing you'll even start seeing ways to use certain machinery to do the cutout, whether it's a table saw or a handheld jigsaw or a bandsaw, things like that. So now I'll stop talking about uh, three piece laminate next because. Uh, I'm going to transition immediately into these two necks here and, and going into more of like a production mindset. Let me check the time. 28 minutes. Wow. There's a possibility I'm going to erase this video and start over, but I'm going to, sh I'm going to pull the trigger and try to finish the video because I really don't like doing videos twice. Just take, take, take a look. That's a little bit oversized. The black lines. For the layout because that's where I'm getting ready to glue my veneer over over the top. I'm really frugal. I cut my veneer. I'm not very wasteful. I'm really cautious about my veneer, but I got to make certain that that veneer doesn't slip or slide. So I'm going to be epoxy gluing this uh, veneer down. And when I get this in place, I'm going to put uh, masking tape out here and back here maybe a little bit on the side just to make sure that it stays in line. But I love the epoxy because as soon as I put that down on the top of the epoxy, it creates a vacuum and this veneer just doesn't move. And so much so that I could put the veneer on this, on this one over here, and I could, I could basically put these two together like this and put, uh, I could put two clamps on it and be finished. And it's insane how you can use the actual two necks to, to build the other. So I'm going to try to uh, end this video here. Okay, this is pretty critical. Uh, it ought to be pretty obvious which one goes to which guitar, but the one on the bottom will go for the hollow body because it's much taller. Okay, considerably taller. It's actually going to get cut off about a quarter of an inch. There's no sense of talking about that. But you can see how uh, 
you know, leave a lot of substance in there and work your way to the finish line. This one's very close to, well, actually, yes, this one is, I forgot. That one is finished as far as my taper and it's ready to be machined with either a three quarter inch round over or a uh, uh, one inch, yeah, one inch radius. I'm talking about like a three quarter inch radius. Oh, I think that's a seven eighths. And this is a one inch. Uh, I'm going to be cutting this one inch because uh, it's going to be a real flat, soft D. So anyway, I'll cover this a little bit more in the future, but uh, I just want you to kind of see how you need to be thinking when you're um, gluing things up and the direction you want to take. And I know it's not very attractive right now, but within just, uh, just a very, uh, within about uh, two hours worth of router work, and a little bit of shaping, you're going to be in that world so fast your head will spin. And it'll blow your mind how quickly the neck just comes alive according to what it is you're, you're, you're building. And then with like the, the, with the Flying V, I'm going to be doing a stinger on both of them. So it'll look something like that right there. And which is really, really, just omit the custom design. Just think of it as being a Flying V. So it'll have the stinger back the black nitrocellulose lacquer and be really attractive. So uh, I'll just show the progress as I'm building the jobs because I really do need to keep these two guitars on point and get them finished because uh, I got bills to pay and, and you don't, you don't pay your bills unless you move guitars. So I appreciate you guys uh, checking in and I hope the information was of, of value. Uh, I can't see why it wouldn't be because especially discussing that binding, that binding can really get you in a lot of trouble and it can really kill your desire to uh, either finish your project or worse, start the next project. And that was one of some of the hardest things that I had to overcome in the front end was where I got really discouraged after the first four to five guitars and then finally, you know, getting back in the saddle and realizing that, you know, you just apply what you learn and uh, build another guitar. So I appreciate you guys checking in and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.